Okay, members. Members resume their seats, please. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. We will start with a list of questions. Uh, questions one and three are withdrawn, and I call Chris Little. Question two. I am currently finalising the discussion document consultation on a future Northern Ireland climate change bill, which I will publish in the next number of weeks. A climate change bill for Northern Ireland must be given proper thought and consultation to ensure that the measures which we take are appropriate and will deliver benefits, and we allow business time to adjust to a new way of working and, where necessary, provide financial support. I have written to the Independent Expert UK Committee on Climate Change for advice on what would be our equitable contribution to the UK's net zero emissions target. I want to consider this information to ensure our emissions reduction targets are credible and evidence-based. Unfortunately, the CCC are not in a position to respond to my request until after they have provided advice on the UK's sixth carbon budget, which will be published in December 2020. I will consider the responses from this discussion document, consultation on a future Northern Ireland climate change bill, along with advice provided from the CCC. I will then present my findings to the Northern Ireland Executive to agree a way forward. Chris Little, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his response. Um, what is the Minister for Environment's timescale for the enactment of a Climate Change Act, and would it not be better for him to add his support to the passage of the Cross Party Climate Change Private Members Bill? Uh, the lifetime of this Assembly. And no, I would not be, because rush legislation is not normally good legislation, as the Member well knows. Uh, we are going about the process correctly going about a public consultation, uh, which you normally do before you introduce legislation. To introduce legislation without consultation is not good practice. It is not given respect to the public that you should do, and therefore I will be bringing forward the legislation appropriately and correctly carried, carried out, as opposed to the rush legislation that he appears to be backing. Call Phil McQuiggan. Uh, Karen Collier, and uh, just following on from the the answers that you have given, uh, Minister, and given that the North is the only place, only jurisdiction on these islands that does not currently have a climate uh, a bill, uh, and given that you did say in this Assembly two months ago that your officials would begin work uh, scoping out uh, the, the options for a climate change, you know, surely uh, you have a time frame where you will be in a position to give some definitive time frame to this Assembly. Well, the time frame is that we are, are, are close to having a consultation document ready, and then we go to public consultation. And uh, you, you take a decision after you have publicly consult, not before, and then you give the public some credibility. But you'll be consulting with the intention of proceeding with the Climate Change Act. But let's consult the public on it and do the thing appropriately, as opposed to ignoring what the, what the public have to say. They call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, can I ask the member, does he agree with me that it is crucial environmental targets are given a strong legal underpinning? And does he agree with me that it is vital we do all we can to prevent coastal erosion in coastal areas like the North Coast? Yes, coastal erosion is a, is a significant issue. It's a, probably even a greater, significant, a greater issue of significance in uh, County Down than it is in County Antrim. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a, a beautiful coastline that needs protected, uh, and that, that's a, a course of work uh, which we are currently doing. And we'll continue to support uh, other organisations and indeed provide um, own, our own quality of work uh, to that. In terms of underpinning, I believe that we do need to set the targets which are, are reasonable targets which are achievable and targets which will make a difference. So, for example, um, we don't have to wait on the Climate Change Act to do some of this. So, for example, um, we are looking at targets at this moment in time of 65 per cent recycling, um, going up from the 50 that we have already achieved ahead of schedule. I would like to push that for, on to, to 70, and the UK position is 65. Um, we have already over, overstepped our target whenever it comes to renewable energy. So we were to produce 20 uh, per cent by 2020. We're on well over 40 per cent, I think around 45. And I want to see that going upwards again. And we could be setting a target of 70 per cent for renewable energy. So you know, these are all things which are achievable and will make a real difference. And that's what's important about this. It isn't an act in and of itself 
It's fine. I have no issues about an act. Uh, but an act in and of itself will not achieve these things unless we actually set ourselves targets that we uh, will we'll actually fulfil. And the history is that we have been fulfilling targets, and we will set targets which we will fulfil going forward as well. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Mr. Speaker, question four. I thank the member for the question. The Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act relates to a range of policy areas gating orders, vehicles, litter, graffiti, dogs, noise and such nuisances, relevant to both clean neighbourhoods and the environment. These policy areas are the responsibility of a number of departments, including my department and the Department for Infrastructure. I can confirm that while my department has no plans to undertake a formal review of its sections of the Act in the foreseeable future, the issues of litter and dog fouling will be considered in DERA's forthcoming draft environmental strategy for Northern Ireland. The strategy will consider options for tackling these ongoing problems in the future and include the outcome of the current review of the fixed penalty notices for litter and dog filing offences. Part 7 of the Act relates to statutory nuisance. Articles 63 and 65 gives district councils the power to deal with noise from premises, including land, which they consider is to be prejudicial to health or amounts to a statutory nuisance. Where a council is satisfied that a nuisance exists, Articles 63 and 65 require the District Council to serve an abatement notice. There are no plans to amend this legislation at present. However, my officials are in communication with the Department of Justice following its earlier consultation on antisocial behaviour. The Department for Infrastructure has confirmed that it has no current plans to review any legislation linked to the Act. David Hedley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the, the Minister's answer to us this afternoon. Uh, I do understand, of course, that the enforcement of such a, a wide-ranging act does fall to uh, local government. However, that's where I believe things fall down. So, I would welcome anything coming forward by way of any any new act at all. Uh, and is there any way that the minister could see working better with the councils who are the enforcers? Because, when looking at the records over the last couple of years, it's been very, very poor enforcement. Well, I'm very keen that this uh, piece of legislation is uh, properly and well enforced. Uh, it was a piece of legislation that I previously brought forward when I was uh, Environment Minister, uh, and therefore we want to see the real uh, benefits arising from it. So certainly issues, um, uh, and, and we will look at these issues in terms of um, the fixed penalty notices around litter and dog filing. Um, we will look at that in, in the Environment Strategy and potentially a new Environment Bill. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can uh, strengthen any legislation that needs strengthening in that form. Call Karen Mull. <coughs> Mr. Chancellor, Minister, dog fouling is a blight on our neighbourhoods. Um, in an area in my constituency, we have particular issues with rodents that apparently feed off it. Minister, are you considering making it mandatory for dog owners, of which I am one, to carry litter bags or appliances for removing fouling when out walking your dog? Um, I haven't given that thought at this moment in time, uh, but it's certainly something that we will consult on um, as part of the environment strategy as to how we can strengthen further uh, issues around dog fouling. Um, dogs are the most wonderful pets, and uh, those of us who, have, who have, have them are very privileged to have them, uh, but it's also something that comes with responsibility, and um, you have a responsibility to ensure to clean up after your dog. It's as simple as that. Well, Pat Mr. Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, um, I hope you'll agree with me that an independent environmental protection agency would be the most appropriate body to, to monitor the implementation of the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure if uh, <coughs> you've informed local councils that you intend to take those powers away from them and uh, how your local councillors would accept that, but uh, perhaps if the SDLP wish to accept that as a policy, um, I'll be happy to, to hear, hear that coming forward in due course. Well, Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One, one of the areas uh, you, the Minister mentioned is covered by the Act is abandoned vehicles and vehicles being worked on in the street, etc. There are a number of locations in my constituency where this is problematic to local neighbourhoods uh, and are blighted by such businesses working in footpaths on the street, leaving oil, abandoned vehicles, causing difficulties for other residents parking. The current legislation is not working, and I would ask the Minister to review that particular aspect of the legislation. 
Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to look at it. <coughs> However, the legislation was brought out in the first instance to, to give councils the powers to deal with these issues. Uh, <coughs> if, if there is a weakness in the legislation, that's one thing. Uh, if there is a weakness in the implementation, then that's another matter. Uh, so we need to identify which it is, whether it's legislation or whether it's implementation of it. Moving on, I call John Blair. At the NSMC Environmental Sectoral Meeting on the 21st of October, I made a commitment to work with my counterpart, Minister Ryan, within the NSMC structures to address environmental issues to our mutual benefit. We agree that our departments would continue to cooperate to deliver tangible environmental improvements in Northern Ireland and Ireland, both now and after the end of the transition period. Cross-border cooperation will continue following the end of the transition period on a wide range of environmental issues, including water quality, international river basin management, bathing water status, blue flag beaches, marine strategy, waste crime, air quality and EU funding. Subject to the approval of the Assembly, the Environment Bill will establish the Office for Environmental Protection in Northern Ireland to perform the environmental oversight role currently undertaken by the European Commission. The OEP will be permitted to share information where it is appropriate or necessary with certain bodies outside the UK that have functions in connection with the protection of the natural environment. This would enable it to share information with, for example, the European Commission in relation to transboundary issues. Any arrangements would take account of current north-south governance. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the information provided in relation to north-south cooperation. Can I ask uh, further to that in relation to east-west cooperation? What uh, action has been undertaken by the Department to ensure that Northern Ireland is included fully in uh, UK government consideration of post-transition period planning? And I ask that because it became clear recently, Mr. Speaker, the Minister will be aware that Northern Ireland had not been included in impact assessments being carried out for emissions trading schemes um, for the future. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are having a debate later um, on emission trading schemes, and uh, those are, s are significant issues that, that I have concerns about in relation to the emissions trading scheme that currently exists. Um, we will be uh, having two emissions trading schemes: one will be UK uh, and one will be EU. Uh, so, because we are still in, the, in the, the single electricity market, the generators who account for 82% um, of the, the carbon trading at the minute. Uh, will probably be in the European scheme, um, whilst other industries will be in the, in the UK one. Uh, the issues that I have is that Northern Ireland, for example, in 2018, paid out something like £65 million of carbon tax into this scheme. And we have been paying those sorts of sums uh, for many years, but have not been able to draw down funding coming from that source, because only three countries um, our only three schemes within a country could benefit. So, UK had, had three larger schemes, which were the beneficiaries of it. Um, however, we are paying all of this carbon tax, but we are not, we're not getting any support to reduce um, from that particular scheme uh, to actually reduce our carbon emissions. And I think that the scheme is flawed in that sense. However, I am going to request that Northern Ireland um, be deemed as a country. Um, once the UK leaves the European Union, because we are still contributing to the scheme, and it may work to our advantage if we can have three significant schemes to bid for at that point. I call Emma Sheeran. My good King Corley, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, um, given that we do live on an island and it has its own environmental landscape and unique characteristics, none of which are affected by the boundary on the island, would you agree that all island uh, cooperation and coordination in relation to environmental issues is vital? I, I don't get too hung up about um, politics when it comes to these types of things. So, whether it was as health minister <coughs> or indeed previously as environment minister, um, I have always worked um, well with, with colleagues um, south of the border and interests uh, which lie mutually to, to, to both parties. Um, so, other people sometimes want to play politics with the north south stuff. I just happen to get on with it. Call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to hear. The Minister is getting on with it, and hopefully we can all get on with a deal and implementation of the protocol. Um, can I ask, in relation to that, about our dairy producers? Um, dairy producers here say that if we leave without a deal, if the UK crashes out of the transition period without a deal, then we will not be able to process at least 35 per cent, possibly more, of our milk 
uh, produced in Northern Ireland. What is the Minister doing to prevent that cataclysmic set of circumstances for our dairy farmers? for a minister to produce papers, uh, which they will take significant account of in terms of their, their negotiations, uh, and we are doing that, in terms of potential um, uh, means of dealing with these problems that have arisen from the protocol. Um, and it is uh, incredibly important that we achieve it and that the European Union recognise, recognise that Northern Ireland could be uh, very damaged as a consequence of the protocol. Um, so, there is a trading scheme that we can do in terms of the dairy sector. Quite worryingly, um, the red meat sector imports around one quarter of a billion pounds worth of beef uh, each year for further processing, supporting around a thousand jobs in Mid Ulster, uh, in particular, in other areas too, but uh, in Mid Ulster in particular. And uh, at this moment in time, um, because of the protocol, um, that business has the potential to be lost. So I've worked in cl working very closely with NIFTA, for example and other organisations in devising uh, a means uh, that will overcome these issues, uh, but we need the European Union uh, to actually work with the people of Northern Ireland in ensuring that Northern Ireland uh, PLC is not damaged, that uh, jobs are not damaged, that consumers are not damaged. Nonsense of things like every supermarket having to put uh, export health certificates on each item. Um, uh, uh, within, a, within a lorry will lead to thousands, in some instances tens of thousands of pounds being added onto a lorry load of goods that will end up in a shop like Iceland or Asda or Sainsbury or Tesco. And the consequence of that is that we will likely lose some of these businesses from Northern Ireland and the consequence job loss, the consequential uh, loss of, of, of potential goods uh, that are on the shelves that people want to buy. And there is a lot of businesses in GB currently talking about pulling out of Northern Ireland market because of the protocol. The protocol as it stands um, is extremely damaging, but it can be, it can be remedied um, sh should the European Union cooperate with us in remedying. I call Gary Middleton. Mr Speaker. Northern Ireland farmers are receiving their full direct payments in one lump sum this year. Payments began to issue on Friday, the 16th of October 2020, with 94% of payments, totalling £256.7 million, going out in the first day. By the end of the first week, of uh, payments had increased to 97%, some £275.5 million, and payment letters are being issued by post, but can also be viewed <coughs> online at their online services. My officials are continuing to verify the remaining claims and issue payments as a matter of urgency. In addition, they have developed a new online claim tracking service so farmers can track the direct payments progress. Gary Middleton, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, would the Minister indicate uh, if farmers are entitled to a reimbursement of the financial discipline deducted from the 2019 scheme, and if so, uh, when will this reimbursement be made to farmers? Yes, thank the member for the question. Yeah, we, we can uh, and, we, and we will. And that happened last year, and we would hope uh, to be in a position uh, to do this by the end of this year. Um, the, the reimbursement of the financial discipline deducted from 29 scheme year payments uh, will be done as a separate payment. Um, and whilst we don't know the exact date, uh, we, we managed to do it for December last year, and we'd hope to be able to achieve that this year. Call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, what financial commitments uh, have you sought from the British Government to maintain the current level of support for farmers after the transition period? I have uh, sought those commitments both verbally and in writing, and uh, I raised them again with, with George Eustace yesterday at the IMG meeting. And uh, we will continue to keep arguing uh, to ensure that Northern Ireland's envelope um, remains. Uh, the same as it has been previously. I call Dagna Magalier. I thank the Minister and indeed I commend himself and the, and the Department for getting 94 per cent of the full payments out to the door on the 16th of October. That is a great result and will be very welcomed by the farm and, uh, and rural community. Uh, can the Minister get, outline when he envisages any changes will, will come about to the basic uh, payment regime following the, transi the transition period? Thank you. Well, there will be modest changes for next year, um, such as um, the greening requirement uh, no longer being applied. Um, I'm also looking at um, 
offering uh, some sort of support uh, for the growing of protein crops, um, because protein crops uh, are something which can divert the, the requirement uh, to be importing protein from uh, countries maybe in, in, uh, where environmental practice may, may not be quite as good as what ours uh, happens to be. And uh, protein crops um, can also contribute to taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere and reduce nitri nitrogen deposition um, going into uh, our peatlands. Uh, but I would like to do something more comprehensive in the following year, and uh, I would say that that will be um, based on ensuring that production is supported and ensuring that high env environmental standards uh, are applied. Um, so that we can ensure that agriculture plays its part uh, in terms of uh, reducing damage to the environment. So there is a course of work that can be done there, and I think that that will provide support to people who are taking uh, significant environmental steps, and will be something which will be beneficial, in, in particularly in the, in, in the Hill areas. Um, and, and the member, I, I, I will be interested in hearing uh, his views on that and, and, and the views of, of colleagues. <clears throat> so, uh, I have no doubt that, that there will be change and significant change, uh, but I think that the change will be um, more measured uh, towards uh, what we actually want to achieve, and what we want to achieve is continued growth in agriculture um, and a continued reduction on the impact of uh, agriculture on the environment. And I call Jerry Carl. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll take question seven uh, and question ten together. And I've been advised by officials from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency that 13 additional gas extraction wells have been installed in the active area of the landfill. The work was completed on the 16th of October uh, 2020. These additional wells have now connected to the gas extraction system. The site gas engineer is currently working on site to optimise gas extraction from the new wells. It may take a few weeks to fully optimise the gas extraction system, as it is important to prevent the ingress of oxygen into the landfill gas management system. NIEA inspectors will continue to check the site, monitor for odours in the Colin area on a regular basis to assess the effectiveness of the additional gas extraction. Jerry Carl, supplementary. Minister, for his uh, answer, my understand and happy to be corrected that the NIEA have not been on site to investigate concerns, but happy if he can elaborate on that. Uh, given that this year already there has been 104 concerns from residents uh, about the Mullock Glass site, which is a five-fold increase from 2018, and given repeated health concerns raised by residents in Lagmore, Mount Eagles, West Belfast more generally, what assurances can the Minister give them that their health is not at risk from potential uh, pollution or noxious gases coming from the uh, site? Okay, the the, the Mullet Glass landfill site is currently assessed as being non compliant uh, with the pollution prevention and control permit. So, NIA <coughs> has directed the operator to take action and implement new measures to address the odour nuisance. The planned installation of the additional gas extraction wells in the active area of the site was brought forward from November to September. Uh, site works to install the new gas wells were completed on 16 October. And as I said, it may take a few weeks for that to be optimised. On completion of the current site works, NIA will require the landfill operator to review their odour management plan and to plan the installation of future well gas wells to minimise the risk of further odour nuisance in the Colin area. Since August 2020, NIA have conducted 14 site inspections and odour checks in the Colin area in response to the complaints from local residents. I call Orlea Flynn. Um, and yes, I know we did hope meetings um, with the, the NIEA in the, um, over the past number of months around this issue, so I am aware that they have been doing work with the Mullen Glass site. Um, but I would like to ask the Minister, um, I know that the site is not due to, it is not expected to close until December 2021, um, and I am wondering if there is, apart from the, the, um, the gas wells and the work that has been done around that, is there any other sort of long-term plans in place to deal with the odours? Because I am speaking not just as the local MLA for the area, but also as a resident who lives in the Colin. They are extremely unpleasant um, to, to live with. Um, so I know that there is work there is work being done, and we are due to meet with the NIEA in December again also. But I am just wondering, outside of the gas wells, is there any other um, plans that you can put in place? Thank you. Well, <coughs> NIA um, have been 
looking at a number of different odour sources and reports of different types of smells across the Colin area. And the inspectors um, for the different regulated sites in the area have initiated joint inspections in the area to further establish what odours are affecting different parts of the Colin area. And they've also been sharing information closely with the relevant environmental health officers in Belfast City Council and Lisburn and City um, Castlereagh uh, Council. I know that they met with yourself and Councillor McGuinness um, earlier on, and they will continue to cooperate um, with yourselves uh, and with all, all their uh, public representatives um, who have concerns uh, about this issue. Well, Pat Kednick. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Minister, as well. And it's, it's just to do with with the, uh, the Muller Glass site up there as well, Minister. Um, I was wondering, do you have anything, uh, plans uh, to seek out some sort of prosecution for those who are responsible? I know well there may well be historic sites there, but there also must be some dumping going on there, which is also creating those odours. Well, uh, unfortunately, fly tipping is, is an issue that, that takes place in the Belfast Hills, and I think that is hugely unfortunate because it's a beautiful part of the, of the world, and uh, we need to ensure that, that councils, number one, offer the services, um, so uh, ensuring that uh, council sites are open to take these materials is, is, is very important, ensuring that councils can collect those heavy goods, teas and so forth from people's houses are, are, are important because sometimes people then employ somebody else to do it. Um, pay them the money to do it, and those individuals unscrupulously will dump uh, those materials. So, you know, there, there are companies who are not engaging correctly, and uh, we need to ensure that we pursue those people. And where those companies uh, who are working with us, um, then we will need to ensure that those companies work with us to eliminate the problems. And that's the course of work that's currently being done. They call Michelle McElveen. 3rd of April 2020, I announced a temporary support package for the sea fishery sector that was geared to cover 50% of a fishing vessel's costs for three months uh, from March through to May 2020, provided there was genuine losses accruing as a direct result of the pandemic. The aim of the scheme was to get support in the ground as soon as possible as a result of the total loss of markets. In total, $1.32 million has been paid out through this scheme to 171 fishing vessel owners. Approximately 1.02 million had been provided to over 10 metre vessels and 300 million to vessels 10 metres and under. On the 26th of May, I announced a scheme of support for Northern Ireland aquaculture undertakings that incurred financial loss through lost markets during the March to May inclusive period. Up to £360,000 was made available to this sector, and in total, 19 aquaculture businesses were invited to apply for support, the level of which was based on the income foregone as a result of COVID-19 during the 1st of March to the 31st of May. 15 applications were received and 15 offers of financial assistance were made and 14 accepted. To date, £83.6,000 has been paid to 13 eligible applicants and a further £13,000 support is being processed for the remaining two applicants. The initial level of support that was anticipated to have been required was overestimated as the figure supplied by business owners was not in many cases as large as was originally indicated. More recently, on 5 October, I announced a further £1.7 million financial support package for sea fisheries, catching sector that continues to be impacted by lost markets as a result of COVID-19. The support package is to deliver a £1.31 million temporary cessation scheme under the European and Maritime Fisheries Fund for the trawlers and dredgers, and is currently open to applications. Invite letters were issued to owners of 111 vessels and to date, 76 applications have been received uh, to the value of £956,000. A fixed cost scheme for the static fishers will be open to applications in early November 2020. Also under the European and Maritime Fisheries Fund, I am currently working with my officials to provide a £336,000 support package to Loch Ness fishermen. Uh, Michelle McElveen, supplementary. Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's response. We can all um, agree this is a challenging time for the fishing industry. Can the Minister outline how the support compares to other regions? And in addition to this, can he detail the steps that he is taking to ensure that any Brexit dividend in respect of additional landings is proportionately distributed across the United Kingdom and that the Port of Vogue fishermen get their fair share? I thank the member for, for the question. And, um, number one, this, this was the quickest, and it was uh, 
the most generous of the packages that, that is offered anywhere in these islands. Um, secondly, in terms of how we go forward, uh, we need to ensure uh, that we get our share of the additional fishing. Um, it is great that we have the opportunity to bid for this. We have been restricted in terms of the amount of fish that can be caught for so many years, um, whilst others um, have utilised our waters and fish that were in our waters. Um, so I want to ensure that Portavogie, Ardlas, um, Kilkeel and all others um, from Northern Ireland get their fair crack of the whip after so many years of not having that. That ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call uh, Martine Anderson. Question number four has been withdrawn. Martine Anderson. Good. Um, Minister, in line with your recent answer to my question with regards to checks at border control post, and you confirmed that they would be able to be performed by EU Council or EU Council uh, experts, Commission experts. Uh, Minister, could you give us an update as to where that's at, given that we're only 58 days away from the end of the transition? Well, I'm glad to say that um, the people who will be checking um, at, at uh, the points of entry uh, will be vets from Northern Ireland, uh, environmental health officers from Northern Ireland, uh, provided by our own department, provided by local authorities, and those are the people who will be providing the checks. Martin Anderson, supplementary. Well, Minister, just to uh, remind you that your department will be making arrangements to comply with uh, official control regulations in order to ensure the controls can be performed by Commission experts in accordance with Article 116 of the Irish Protocol. Minister, you know, do you not agree or do you even understand that there are some people feeling that you are behaving more like a Brexiteer as opposed to a Minister? Well, I, I, I can assure the, the member that I am a, a Brexiteer, um, uh, uh, and I am also, also a minister. And there are others who, who will oppose Brexit and be ministers, and that is uh, perfectly entitled to be that case. The reality for the member, of course, is that we are leaving the European Union. Um, that has been done, and that is dusted. And, uh, fr from, from the 31st of December 2021, uh, the implementation period uh, will be over. Um, I oppose the points of entry. I always have. Um, I think the protocol brings huge problems to us, uh, but nonetheless, there is an imposition that has been placed upon us, and we will provide uh, the appropriate personnel. Um, we will seek to reduce any invasion whatsoever uh, in terms of um, the, 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 the number of inspections that need to take place, and minimise this in as much as possible to retain normal business relations with key customers and with key suppliers, because I see absolutely no point in creating barriers between ourselves and our key markets and, indeed, our key suppliers, because all that will do is cause job losses in Northern Ireland, cost consumers more amount of money, and if the member wishes to have that, stand up and say it. I don't. I call Claire Bailey. Um, and thank you to the Minister for a question received this morning to a priority question that I put in. And the Minister has confirmed then that aer aer anaerobic digester plants treating agricultural waste must have planned permission in place prior to his department issuing waste management licences. So following from that, can I ask um, the Minister, have any of these waste management licences been issued retrospectively, and if any of those AD plants treating agri waste are currently operating without planning permission? Uh, the, the letter is, is or, or the answer to the question is quite clear. <coughs> is that um, you know, if, if you establish an honour with the gesture uh, prior to having planning permission, uh, you look at your waste uh, management licence. Um, if you get the, your, your planning permission retrospectively, then you can apply for your waste management licence. Claire Bailey. I thank the, answer, or the, the Minister for not answering the question. But maybe further from that, then, um, given that we know from your own stats, Minister, that uh, in some of our special areas of conservation, um, ammonia levels breach our current regulations by up to 350 per cent year on year on year. And of course, this is exasperated by these AD plants um, at times. So what enforcement or regulation powers does his department have to take action? 
Interesting to see that uh, the member is against uh, green energy and actually taking materials like um, animal waste and, and slurries and, and turning that into gas, which can then be used for electricity, um, which can go into people's homes and, and, and businesses. So it's an interesting line that, that the Green Party is opposed to, to, to green energy in this instance. In terms of ammonia, um, we, we can we can go down blind alleys on ammonia or we can actually tackle the problem. And we have an ammonia strategy which um, will be ready for, for, for launching in the very near future. <coughs> and we will be able to reduce ammonia significantly. Nobody has done that up to now. That hasn't, that hasn't happened up to this point, but it's going to happen under this minister. I call Dagna Magalier. Good, Ken Corlia. Um, the Minister will be aware of um, recent correspondence to, from the Finance Minister to the Chair of the Finance Committee, which was shared by the Euro Committee, which highlighted some concern regarding the, how the replacement funding uh, will be calculated, that, that this could actually result in a, a cut to funding for rural communities. Has his department any assessment of this here and the impact it would have for local areas? Um, tre Treasury would indicate that uh, they think that they can take £34 million pounds that um, would previously have been identified for us. Um, we are contesting that. It is uh, slightly less in Scotland um, per head of population and, and significantly greater in Wales. Mm -hmm. And as I understand, <coughs> it is happening in England as well. Uh, I believe that it is something that uh, we all need to oppose. Uh, Scottish and Welsh colleagues have written uh, with myself um, to the appropriate ministers um, at Westminster. We are seeking a meeting with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, to ensure that, <coughs> that this money is actually paid. Thank you, Michael, here. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, we, um, we also learned recently that there has been uh, little or no progress on the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund. And I just want to has the many, Minister any assessment of that there? And what is his general assessment of the British Government's commitment to replacing the lost EU funding that will happen here as a result of um, leaving the EU? Thank you. Um, there is no indication on any other source that there is a problem. Um, this has been money that had not been spent but would have been spent by 2023. Um, our department will, would make the argument that it has been acting prudently in terms of its distribution of the funding and they are being punished as a consequence of that. Um, and as I indicated, Wales are, are suffering even worse as a result. Um, and I, I think that we will continue to strongly argue uh, for that particular funding, but there is no indication of a problem elsewhere. I call Keith Buchanan. Minister so far, my question relates to uh, Minister Gordon, the recent announcement of the Farm Business, business Investment Scheme uh, currently released. Could you give me an outline how this support will continue to reduce emissions and, in tandem, increase the nutrient uptake? Well, um, one of the elements of the new Farm Business Investment Scheme is that we will give additional points uh, for people who are covering tanks, uh, for people who are uh, buying equipment, uh, which is low emission spreading, uh, applied to it. Uh, and this will itself um, help with the ammonia problem that, that Ms Bailey raised earlier on. And that is a course that we intend to run out um, over the next number of years. Not just that, um, but, 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 but we, we will add to that going forward. Uh, and the consequence of it is that um, more of the nutrients um, gets to the area where it needs to go, less of it gets into the atmosphere. And uh, in conjunction with uh, a course of work which we intend to introduce at a later point in terms of soil sampling, uh, farmers will have a better knowledge of what their fields exactly need. Uh, and consequently, this should bring about uh, a further reduction in emissions and indeed savings for farmers in terms of reducing uh, the amount of uh, inorganic fertilisers that they would acquire uh, to augment. Uh, the nutrients that they have on farm. Keith Buchanan, supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for your answer so far, Minister. Um, you indicated there you are going to obviously roll this out in future years, or you intend to. Do you envisage that being a, more of an increase of financially per year? Because obviously a lot of equipment is, is tired on farms, so we will use that terminology, and indeed that up to modern standards. So do you see that figure increasing yearly? Well, we are always, we're always could do with a bit more money, so, so I will be looking to colleagues in the Department of Finance. 
um, to assist us because what, what, what we want to do is to take Northern Ireland to, to carbon neutral uh, by 2050. Agriculture needs to make its contribution and uh, therefore it will need support uh, in arriving at that point. Agriculture, of course, um, is involved in, in carbon sequestr- se- sequestration as well, and that is an important element of it, that we, on one hand, um, reduce uh, and lower emissions, and on the other hand, uh, we increase the carbon sequestration that takes place in farms, and that way we can make a real impact on the environment for the good. Nicole, Jim Allister. Can the Minister yet lift the veil of secrecy and update the House on the infrastructure for an Irish sea border that his department is providing at our ports, and where and when can that documentation be inspected? Um, I, I believe that <coughs> we have got uh, permissions back on, on two uh, sites, and, and we'll have the third one uh, this week. Uh, and I have instructed officials uh, as soon as they um, receive that. Uh, to make those available to any member who may wish to have them. Jim Allister, supplementary. <coughs> uh, of course, to date, there has been a refusal to release those either at council level or departmental level. So it would be good to see them in due course. But has the, can the minister tell us, as he builds the gallows for the union at Larne, has he got the support of the member of parliament? For East Antrim? Well, uh, the Member of Parliament for East Antrim and myself is the same position. Um, we, we don't want to see um, these facilities. Um, we don't desire these facilities. This is an imposition that has been applied to us uh, through a neg- negotiation between the Prime Minister and the European Union, which introduced the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, we are totally opposed to the Northern Ireland Protocol because it has significant damage to potential or significant potential to damage Northern Ireland. And uh, the Member of Parliament for East Antrim and myself uh, share that view. Call Emma Sheeran. Gormagat Ken Corley. Minister, uh, I know I met with you back in the summer about this, um, about the situation in Loch Ney and the fishing community there. And in September, you responded to a written question that I had sent you saying that you were committed to providing a, a package of support to the fishing men and women on Loch Ney. Can I get an update on that, please? Uh, yes, um, we had to take some legal advice on, on the distribution of the funding. Um, that uh, legal advice has been received, and we are, are now in a position. Uh, to move forward with this. Um, so I would hope that over the course of the next number of weeks uh, we will be able to indicate um, to the fishermen on the ground uh, what is available to them. Thank you, Minister. That is welcome news. Can you confirm what engagement uh, you have had with the fishing community in Loch Ness around this? Well, I have received a lot of communication and, and we have responded to them. I have not met them personally. Um, but I am um, happy to meet people uh, if, if they require it. Um, however, we have the funding set aside, and I would hope that uh, my fisheries division will be in a position, who, who have been engaging closely with the community, um, will be in a position uh, to move this forward with my authority. The next name members on the list are not in their seats, and uh, so therefore that concludes this session. And, uh, so could I ask members just to take a raise while we prepare the chamber for the next question time.